I'm so glad we were able to make it and that we didn't have Snowmageddon again. Um, so, we're, I, for the televised audience, this is the December meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Uh, we should go around the room, introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Eitan Nasreddin Longo, Chair, um, pronouns he and him. Uh, would you? Sure. Go ahead. I'm Ingrid Jonas, Vermont State Police. I am the designee for Commissioner Anderson, <clears throat> and pronouns she and her. David Chair, Assistant Attorney General, designee for the Attorney General, and he and him. Curtis Reed, uh, Executive Director, Vermont Partnership for Fair <coughs> University, uh, he and him. Rebecca Turner, Defender General's Office, designee of the Defender General. She and her. Uh, Jeff Jones, uh, ACLU and uh, XDSP. I guess he and me. I don't know. Farini Adinia, my pronouns are she her. Sheila Lincoln, Root Social Justice Center, Brattleboro, and she and her. I'm Monica Weaver, Administrative Services Director at the Department of Corrections, designee for the Commissioner, uh, she and her. I'm Melissa Sharnetsky, I'm a Corrections Research Analyst at the Department of Corrections, and she and her. I'm Jessica Brown, I'm an Attorney General appointee from the community, as well as a public defender for the Defender General's Office, my pronouns are she and her. Gary Scott, I'm a lieutenant with the State Police, and my pronouns are Wafi Fawol, Vermona for Justice in Palestine, Mumble Black Life Matter, the Greater Burlington, he, him. Uh, I'm Robin Joy, I'm the Director of Research for Crime Research Group, and she and her. Oh, that's it? Okay. Everybody's here. Um, let us do the approval of the minutes. I realized that was several years ago. <laughs> um, it's almost last year. Yeah, <laughs> you're right, it's almost last year. Um, it, I, I have one uh, moment which is just incredibly selfish. In the attendance part, I was here. Did I leave you out? Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually was here. That's okay. I just, it was one of those invisible man moments, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was the October meeting, right? right? Yeah, that was the October meeting, uh, October 9. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else that anybody came up with? I, I had my selfish moment, and that was about it. <laughs> anybody want to, you know? Oh, sure. I wasn't at the one hour. Right. I moved to approve the October 9th. Uh, okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? All abstaining? I'm abstaining. So okay. Yeah, but that's the right way to do it because I wasn't here either. So. Yeah, no, that's fine. If, if you weren't here, abstain. But they carry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, announcements, uh, regrets, Chief Don Stevens is out of town tonight, so he will not be able to be here and sends his regrets. Poor Ken Schatz has some evil, pathological, horrible, uh, and is not doing very well, and he's not happy, yeah. and um, so he's not going to be here, which also means that Karen Vasting's not going to be here, because she's like overwhelmed taking up the slack for him. And so she wasn't gonna be able to be here either. So those are, they're, they're both down. <clears throat> but on the positive side, I got this wonderful picture from Pepper of two absolutely oh. adorable babies. I mean, just, I want one. And I don't think he'll give me one, but I want one. They're really, really cute. So I was hoping he'd be here tonight, but anyway, so on the announcement front, we do have some positive news that doesn't have to do with someone being sick. So, anyway, um, that's about it for announcements. We should move on then to the discussion. Monica, can you, can you introduce Dr. Shonetsky for sure. us? And yeah, so what I wanted to do, I'll introduce Liz and also just sort of give an overview. Please. Of, I thank you for, and then I hand it over 
to Liz um, to walk through the report with uh, um, everyone. So um, this is <coughs> Liz. We call her Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. She I'm is new. with. Uh, <laughs> she's relatively new with the Department of Corrections. Um, just six months, and she is a corrections research analyst. And this is uh, one of the first projects that Liz undertook at the, at the, at the Department of Corrections. We're happy to have her here recently, uh, coming from UVM. She can tell you a little bit about her experience there. Um, but before I hand it over to her, I do want to just give a, a little bit of context about the, about the report. Um, it's been out <coughs> since uh, October 15th. We were required to... Um, oh, Online. Oh, yeah. It's been online for quite some time. On the legislative reports? Yeah. And we testified at uh, Justice Oversight. <coughs> Just our legislative church. It was buried. Okay, sorry. Just well, yeah. No, I always have trouble finding. Okay. Um, well, I also mm -hmm. gave it to you. To yeah, I sent it. So oh, that I was sent the, it out. Uh, Again, so, this was in the pre cambium yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. but I, I did yeah. send it out. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, we tried not to um, make it a secret. Right. Um, as, to, as to where you as to where you could find I, it. I probably should have resent it. I'm sorry. I. I and what site is it on? I'm sorry. Do you know what the actual site is? Do I know the actual path? It's on the, <laughs> it's on the legislative website under the justice. I mean, I could probably find it if I look for it, but I couldn't tell you the exact path because it's probably pretty long. But they post it on the report page. So every time you submit a report to the legislature, it gets posted on the report page. So you can... Yeah, there's a reports and research tab at the top of yeah. the page. And then you go to that, and then go to reports and research and overview, and then it'll be a list, and then it'll be on that list. Yeah. So that's... Or we can send it to you again, but if you I want to, <laughs> you know, or I'll do it again but tomorrow. Anyway, it's um so it's been out since October fifteenth because that's when we uh, had to submit it, and then we did go and present the report to the Joint Justice <coughs> Legislative Oversight Committee. It's a mouthful. Uh, I think the following week we were there and it just kind of coincided with their meeting. So, um, and through that process of presenting it to justice oversight, um, it, it became very clear to us that there were some expectations about this, re this report um, that because of the way the questions were asked, they were in the executive <coughs> summary, um, you could see very clearly what the legislature asked us to do. Um, and we did what they asked us to do. And that was to look at the people who entered a correctional facility in 2017 and describe the characteristics of that population. And so we did, um, we did exactly what they asked. And as we started to have conversation with them, um, it was a little bit more clear that the report didn't sort of answer some of the underlying questions that a lot of people have um, around the population in incarcerated. So we're already, you know, aware aware of that, and there, there was some conversation for some of you who were at that meeting that the committee was having around mm -hmm. who else, and maybe looking at different parts of the system to answer <coughs> some of these larger questions that, that they have. Um, in the meantime, they did give us some other questions that we can certainly go back and look at. But I want to I want to say that up front because I think it's really important for people to understand this does not answer a lot of questions, and it was because we responded to what the legislature asked. <coughs> so what we want to do is um, go through, and Liz will go through and describe um, each section of the report um, and what we were able to do and not able to do. Um, you can see also in the executive summary, I think it's I probably shared this with you all before, some of you, that we did as we were putting the report together recognize that there's some work that we need to do on our own to get a better handle on our data. And that has a lot, and I actually am interested in this group's um, ideas around this in terms of um, the way inmates identify their race and ethnicity and how we can capture that um, and the types of ways that we can answer the questions in this kind of category. We know that we can make changes to our offender management system to allow for certain types of data collection. Uh, and we 
really like to do that, um, including a more comprehensive array of ethnic categories for ethnicity, which is pretty limited right now. Um, in terms of what we ask, it's not limited in terms of its capacity to be able to report it. Um, so any questions about that before I turn it over to the room? And if you want to say more about sort of like your background, I think that would be helpful too. Yeah. Um, all right. I am Liz Tranetsky. I am a Corrections Research Analyst. <coughs> my background is in experimental psychology. Uh, I finished up my PhD from UVM, and my emphasis is in social psychology, so this is a departure for me, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, let's see. Any good data dive will uncover more questions than it answers, and I think this, this report is no exception to that. I think we are left asking more questions and more really good questions. Um, but what we were tasked with doing, as Monica already mentioned, was really illustrating a picture of what our incarcerated population looked like as it related to some key factors that the, um, the group was interested in. So looking at trends that they might relate to our racial uh, demographic background and whatnot. Um, so we looked at a few different things in this report. We looked at a, a comprehensive overview of, of various demographic pieces of information, which I'll walk through. We looked at um, crimes and sentence length. Um, uh, more to come on that caveat. We were limited in the data that we had access to and what we were able to do with it. Um, and then we were also asked to do some interstate comparisons between Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. And I'll speak to that a little bit more. But just generally, that's what we we're tasked with looking at. Again, all descriptive, we really didn't make any causal claims about what underlying mechanisms or factors might lead to disparities that are observed or not observed, um, but really just creating a, a comprehensive illustration of what our incarcerated population looks like. Uh, so section one did just that. It was the analyses that pertain to different demographic factors of our incarcerated population. Um, this is on page five. So the data that was used in section one <coughs> included all of our incarcerated individuals, so everyone that came into a facility in 2017. It did include Vermont detainees, but it excluded <coughs> federal detainees. Excluded rural? Federal. federal. And when you say incarcerated, <coughs> are you saying pre-conviction, post-sentencing mm. com combined? Sentence and detained people. So you're saying the entire group, yes. pre-conviction, pre-sentence, <coughs> post. Got it. That are in the state or within the system? Well, that are. It includes the out of state population. So at the time, these people would have been in the beginning, but it includes the out of state population. Does it, is it broken down in that way? Yes. Okay. And uh, a little later. A little later. A little later. Um, so table one just gives you a breakdown of our inmate population by their identified racial category. Um, the majority of our incarcerated population uh, was identified as white, so 85%, with a total of 5,769 people incarcerated. Just giving you a general idea of the racial breakdown of our population. <coughs> Can you just explain again, if I, I don't know if I heard it, who, who identifies, do they self-identify? They do, do not self-identify currently. Um, that is a system that we would like to move towards. It is not a system of self-identification. I think that so, there's so, some, I think that the, the issue there is that it's not uniform in terms of the way the, right. the, it's collected. So some people may be asked by a booking officer and some people may just be identified by the person and a category put in the system. So this is at the time of arrest or booking? It's when um, they are doing an intake is when they collect this data. And so the officer either makes that decision <coughs> and or could ask somebody and that go into the decision, but ultimately it will be relies on the officer and what their thoughts, opinions, and experience in that situation was to what they put. I think there's a variety of ways that this happens, and that's what we were trying to make sure that we can get a little bit more uniformity in the way we collect the data. There's no standardization yeah. to the process of the collection currently when this was collected. And our, but that is identified as a limitation in a. a and we talked about that. And are these the only categories in which they think of when they're making those identifications? They only as well? included categories at the time that this data was collected. 
So again, would that be the only categories in which the officers would be thinking about with when doing intakes? There would be no way for me to know that. I don't, I don't know how we would answer that question. So the, I think the way I would say it is that there's a drop-down list in the, in the system, and they either have to pick from the list or leave it blank or say unknown. Right, and, and these the are the categories. Right. Okay. So do you rely then on arrests or information or when they come into your facilities? It's when you they come in. So it's part of the intake process when somebody is physically in front of an officer. By an officer, though, you mean a corrections a officer. A booking when officer. They come in and, to, yeah. Come into the correct. Department of Corrections. That's correct. As opposed to a local arrest. Right. It's our booking officer. Okay. And one more question, because I know you said there wasn't a standardized uniform question or way to uh, identify, but can you confirm whether everyone is asked being asked, or is it that only certain people are being chosen to ask? I don't know how to answer that question okay. either, right? So everyone is supposed to, the question or the box is supposed to be completed for every person who comes in, right? We're supposed to capture the information. How that gets captured mm -hmm. is, a, is, again, something that we believe there's a lot of variety and I can't tell you. That's a question related yeah. to fidelity to protocol and right. unfortunately I don't think that we have the information to be able to assess that. Mm -hmm. um, the is, other is caveat there, to all of the data is that what we were working with at the time of that we were putting together this report was with existing data, so we were limited in the scope of things that we could actually draw from. We did not collect data to construct this report. Um, this was drawn purely from previously collected data. Right, it's administrative data yeah. that we collect through the process of doing our work through. So it sounds like, <coughs> oh, go ahead. So data that comes from the court didn't have access to, but just in terms of DOC procedure, um, <coughs> my understanding is that if someone's been convicted or arrested, that the race or ethnicity of that individual is known to the court. And is that right, Rob? <laughs> yeah, it is, but I'll tell you that their data is missing a lot of race data. Um, and so when, uh, and I judge correct me on the process, but my understanding is, is that's coming in from the fingerprint supported arrest and it's being um, identified from the FBI and DCIC. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that although we can call it court data, it's relying on whatever information the police yeah. have identified when they file and uh, process the uh, individual and mm -hmm. it comes through the state's attorney's office, I'm assuming they certainly don't do any identification, so they're relying on mm -hmm. police. That's the paperwork that ends up in the court, and we don't make any separate inquiry. Yeah. Uh, so although we may in juvenile dockets, but that's mm -hmm. a whole separate issue. So then it's possible that a single individual may be identified as two different races. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. okay. or, and there's different categories yeah. in every different yeah. criminal mm -hmm. justice database. database. Sure. Or initially identifies as black or Hispanic and yeah. then doesn't get picked up or identified later on. So, so to go back to what I was, so we absolutely recognize that this is an issue with our data. And one of the things that we want to do is come up with a, a much more clear practice that we can tell our staff, this is how you are to collect this data, this is the question you need to ask, this is how you capture it. This is the order <coughs> that you ask the question. That's work we were doing actually prior to this report being requested of us, we, and, but it requires us changing our database around. So it's something we're, we've been aware of, and I think this group's question is just mm -hmm. sort of helps us realize it's really important to do. Are you all also saying that they're only allowed to check one box? That is an issue and that we can change that as well. So right now, the, the race category is you can be one of these and that we need to, and we've already identified the fact that we're going to have more than one race drop down so that people can identify. 
time mm -hmm. as more than one. Because um, we'll, we will be able to do that. But yes, right now, and that's, um, we recognize that as a limitation. So I'm just leaping ahead here as Captain Obvious, who's like concerned about this report that we've got to write. There's a lot of standardization, it seems like you need in order to do this data the way that you even want to do it. Yeah. That's not there at the moment. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so that would be something that we should, in fact, consider as a panel when we start making recommendations to the General Assembly? Well, <coughs> you may not need to make it to the General Assembly because we're already in the process of figuring out okay. how we want to do this. And so helping us and making recommendations to us okay. so that we would implement it. I don't think we need to go to the it doesn't need to go of there. going to the General Assembly. Okay. You know, that's great. great. We're, we're willing and interested in hearing what we think would be the best practice for doing right. this. So I don't know if you'll yeah. express this later, but then I'm just wondering what the barriers have really been up to now, because I feel like I've had this conversation about a decade ago with the same responses and the same answers in terms of the specific format of how we collect data. And actually, I know I've had the same conversation for the last 10 years. So I'm just wondering um, what current barriers are there to have still have this conversation like 10 years later of, asking those questions and having something that clearly even many of these people around the table who've been doing it for a while too. Just well, I can't really speak to what was going on 10 years ago because I, I wasn't with the department of Justice at the time. So, so what barriers, I, do you see any I, barriers I now to having a formal right now, I think the, no, I don't that. think there's any barriers now other than figuring out the procedure and making and going out and really describing to our staff how we need to do it and changing the offender management system. Robin has a question. Yeah, yeah so um, to deal with the whole system, um, and I have been here for 10 years or more. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know the, what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> the courts are getting a new case management system. The courts are getting a new case management system. They just got a new case management system. And the old joke was that Department of Corrections would get an update you know, sometime long after the courts did. That was the old joke. And we're still at the point where, you know, the courts are going through their case management system. The, the police have two different CAD RMS systems, and one is kind of more new, and one is, you know, can be programmed a little bit better. Um, but I think, you know, to answer your question, the, it's the legacy systems that were created mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago. Um, that are, are part of the problem and getting those changed. And so um, I don't know what the court's process is for it, you know, getting public input on their new CAD RMS system or your new case management system. What do you system. call it? CAD what? On the police side, I, I use a lot of words. The, on the police side, it's called a CAD RMS system. On the court side, it's called a case management system. It's the, it's the structure of the data. Um, it's how the data are structured. So that's, that's been a huge barrier is getting those systems changed. And, but what is the barrier to getting them changed? That's not, I'm hearing that that's a barrier, but I'm not quite hearing what the barrier has actually been. Um, you want to go through? Well, I mean, with the court system, which is, I just can't tell you how old it is. Um, it's old, so we're in the process of um, getting a new case management system that will take probably, I mean, we started about a year ago, um, and it takes to get the, the, the entire state covered um, three or four years. Um, we expect the first section of it, portion of it, to be rolled out in the spring in the Judicial Bureau, and then the next, uh, hopefully by summer, if everything stays on track, <coughs> we would uh, <coughs> introduce it into Wyndham, Windsor, and Orange Counties, um, and then about a year later, um, the rest of the state. But um, the court, attempted a new case management system a number of years ago before I was in this position uh, without success. Um, and so they have started again, and um, this one will be seen through to the end. So I have one more question. Like, when you say this case management system, who created that, or who is in creation of that? Well, we're dealing with a vendor who has a system that is used in um, any number
number of states, but at least in regionally, um, Maine has just introduced a similar system or is in the process of it. <coughs> New Hampshire has had portions of it for a number of years. Um, Rhode Island is another place we visited. So it's a, it's a nationally recognized system. Um, and who in Vermont has had the opportunity to vet that system when choosing that system for our, for our state? Court, the court vetted, vetted a number of vendors before deciding on this one. So when you say the court, that is, it's going to be, I'm sorry if that seems like an ignorant question, but what does that mean, the court? I'm sorry. Um, management within the court system, judges, staff, anyone, anyone who would put their hands on the system and have to process the information that comes into the court. Okay, so it's a sort of what I would consider, say, really top down to where it's being vetted by the people who are also... I would say bottom up, it's staff and, and the people that are actually every day putting their hands on the computers that have to know how to take the information in over the counter and put it into a system that is available. It, it, it's not, I mean, ultimately the decision is made by the court to sign a contract, but the information leading up to the um, acceptance of one vendor over another was for the most part um, groups of people systems. Um, so when I mean, when, when I think of the term bottom-up, that would mean the people that are most directly impacted, which are the people who are actually going into the system, would be part of mm -hmm. that, not the people who are just delivering the services. So we just have a different understanding of what bottom-up means. And um, so <clears throat> I just wanted to know if the community at large, because that's what we are here, we're the community at large, giving our expertise around the state and our various positions to help make this successful. So I like this process better than what I think has happened in the future, in the past, where it sounds like a court system who is the ones who are going to be implementing those systems, not necessarily the ones who are most impacted by those systems are the ones who are learning. And that's not what I mean. I mean, we need to have a more totality of a, of a conversation around that. Because if the court system is seeing this, yes, they have an expertise in that, but it's us who are on the ground, us who are being um, put into this system who also know, hey, why don't you ask us? Just ask us an open-ended question or whatever. It's like, wouldn't that be easy to solve all of this stuff we've done over the last 10 years? I mean, that's just off the top of my head. But so it's things like that to where asking, the, again, the most directly impacted people, and those are the ones who are actually incarcerated, the ones who have been incarcerated, and the ones working with those people on the ground who are um, in either whatever spectrum of that that's happening. Mm. Why don't, let's keep going because I know you've got, we're like only on page five and I know there's 31. <laughs> yeah, there's, so. <laughs> it's, it would be very hard to get through the whole report right. in that regard. So we can stop in areas where people think are, we want to discuss and move to areas where we don't it, want I just want a quick yes or no question. Okay. <laughs> if it really is a quick yes or no, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, okay. is Hispanic being, um, like is, is Hispanic being used as a race? This is part of the problem, is the distinction between race and ethnicity in this mm -hmm. But Hispanic is neither a race or ethnicity. Again, we, right, <laughs> this is why we need, we're working on trying to put things in the right category and then train people <coughs> and, um, and eliminate things from the drop-down list that are inappropriate to be in that list. So, so right now there's things in the list that, we're, that we know aren't technically part of the list, but they're there because um, Again, it was um, somebody made it up along the way. Somebody made it up along the way, and it's, it's important, to, you know, that um, the state, at least for us, I won't speak for the court, but the state re requires, oftentimes, departments who when we make these really large IT purchases, um, to buy an already existing off-the-shelf um, right. Right. database, right? And, and that's what we had to do with our databases by an already existing off-the-shelf database that came pre-populated, pre-structured, and had some ability for us to configure. And we uh, have been regularly going through and reconfiguring and trying to make it better. And this is one of the areas where we, we still have work to do. And so that's um, something that we recognize. And and just to echo that, that, that's why our, the first system that we attempted to um, put into place Work. We were trying to build it, <coughs> and build it on your own, and it, yeah. and it just did not work. And so we finally gave up on that. And the system we had, as I said, is a nationally recognized yeah. vendor that we had very little control over. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 
configuration. Right. Okay. So it, 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 it comes, as soon as you get it, it comes with the limitations of, of the off the shelf. Right. So, and, mm -hmm. you know, so we're working through it. Anyway. Uh, we were explicitly asked to also look at the geographic distribution of our inmate population. So specifically looking at their last reported county of residence and then drilling that down further, breaking it down by their identified race. Um, so what we have in Table 2A is uh, inmates reported last county of residence broken down by their identified race. Um, and without getting too in the weeds, this is a, not a super friendly table, but the greatest proportion of our incarcerated population was from Chittenden County. 17% um, of the incarcerated individuals who reported Chittenden County as their county of residence, which I know is a mouthful, it's a, a statement with a lot of qualifiers. 17% um, of them were identified as people of color, and of that group of people of color, 84% of them were identified as black. You're on page six? I am on page six. It looks like the largest category of unknowns. Part of that gets back to the issue that we were just discussing, a reporting error. So if an individual um, was, if there was not anything reported under race that was recorded as unknown, <coughs> Or this probably could also account for individuals who have an identity that would consist of multiple racial Are you talking about identification or county? I just, I wanted to make sure I understood your question. Yeah. Um, the unknown, uh, unknown Vermont, Vermont unknown. Vermont oh, Vermont. under the county. So that would qualify, that is our um, out of state population. So they either did not list a county or they would not be a county in Vermont. So, no, so there's two, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure people are um, really... Vermont concerned. unknown and then out of As state. As Vermont unknown and then out of so state. So it it's on the continuing page? Right. Okay. Correct. So there's unknown Vermont. They did not list a specific county in Vermont or out of state. So that is unknown to us. It was listed as an out of state. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, <laughs> and I think... Does that mean that, that they, they self-identify as coming from identity. Vermont, they just didn't specify for a county. Yeah, a right. county. And then there are people who identify as having come from out of state or their last address wasn't out of state. Right. We just yeah. know out of state. Yeah. How are people who are homeless identified? I'm sorry? How are people who are homeless? They're usually homeless? identified as homeless. As homeless? Yeah. Um, so they would be Vermont's no county. county. Yeah. Unknown. Yeah. yeah. There's a mm -hmm. home there. If we know that they're homeless in a particular county, we may put the county in there, right? Yeah, so it's like, yeah. you know, you're homeless and we know that you generally are in this area, we could put the county in there, but we wouldn't put an actual street address, which is kind of where the um, homeless entry would go. And that doesn't always happen, it's just if you know that, you can do that. There's yes. also, which okay. is way beyond the scope of understanding Got this it. particular table, but there's also recorded null answers as well, which would probably account for a lot of those particular mm -hmm. instances. What answers? Right. No. No. no, so just NA or null. No, um, no and that for the purposes of this, they were filtered out, so we only included people that had some sort of a response that we could analyze. Um, so a lot of those instances would probably fall in those categories. Right, so what... Were there other questions on the county breakdown? Um, so the out, of, the out, of, uh, out of state then is roughly 14 to 15 percent of the, of the whole group, right? incarcerated mm -hmm. population. Right. So if I'm down down the page out of state and it says uh, underneath black it says 14 percent out of state so that all the black people incarcerated in Vermont 14 percent out of that black population 14 percent out of the whole population 14 percent of the people that listed an out of state county of residence identified as black so it's not 14 percent not the out of the population. whole population out of the county Uh, 
And I want to make sure that people understand the distinction here that if, when we talking about out of state in this table, we're talking about where people said they lived. We're not talking about the out of state population, the right. people who are incarcerated who are housed somewhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. that, I it's really want to make sure people understand that. That's a diff that's a important distinction. Right. So in theory, we should know the demographics of the non incarcerated black population shouldn't and be able to pair that with a percentage of 14.3 percent incarcerated. That's in right? Appendix B. Appendix B. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, I will say a caveat to that. What we had available to us at the time was the general census data for each of those counties. So you would also have to keep in mind that the entire population of a particular county is also not going to map on exactly with the incarcerated population. Mm -hmm. So that includes everyone, not just people between a particular age range. That's what we have reported from 17 onward. So it's something to keep in mind that's not an exact way to calculate the percentage, but it's a good reference. So you can use the Appendix B as at least a reference to give you an idea. It's behind you. you have a yeah. Well, it's just a general comment as you, as your committee talks about categories and so on and so forth. Is thinking about what are you going to compare those categories to? Yeah. And so when you use some of the census data, the census um, includes uh, Hispanic as an ethnicity. Um, and in, you use some of those tables, and right now most of the state data systems don't. Mm -hmm. um, so that means, for example, you're limited in some of the tables that you can use where you can screen out uh, underage mm -hmm. people and things like that. So as you think about what you want to compare to, um, yeah, think about what data are available and, you know, to. About. So, for example, some of the race and, and traffic stop data includes infants and children who aren't driving. Right. Well, except maybe 10 um, Right. right. And, and the same thing here, um, but part of that is because of the way the data are structured. Okay. Mm. Thank Which you. Which is why we did not include comparative analyses. So, just a, this is again, we are right. being purely descriptive with our population and included Appendix B as a reference for general yeah. interest. Um, Table 2B, hang with me on this one. This is a little bit um, a little bit complex. It is, uh, we ran a test, it's called the Chi-Squared Goodness of Fit Test. So what this does is it allows you to determine whether or not the number of a particular group that you observe. So this is the data points we actually have access to. In this case, it would be the number of black and white incarcerated individuals in our data subset. Whether or not that group of observed individuals is going to be significantly different from what you would expect, and I use that word um, in a very particular way, so it is a mathematically derived term, so expect based on a proportion, so proportion to a population. Mm -hmm. So hang, and, and that's why I said hang with me, this is, this is not particularly user friendly. Um, so what we wanted to do though, is we wanted to run this test to determine whether or not our observed proportion of incarcerated black individuals in the three counties that we focused on um, would differ from our hypothesized county. Again, that comes with my caveat. This is not something, this is not an observed number. This is a mathematically derived number based on a, a proportion. And in the footnotes, I tell you exactly how I calculated that mm -hmm. hypothesized number. Um, so essentially, we just want to know whether or not our proportions would be significantly different. For Chittenden County, the observed number of incarcerated black individuals was lower than that mathematically derived hypothesized proportion. For Franklin County, it was uh, the observed number of incarcerated black individuals was higher significantly. Um, and then for Rutland County, there was no significant difference in our observed and hypothesized proportions. I can give you a moment to digest that if you would like. Franklin County is not significant, even though they're young. Babies. Franklin County is. Franklin County, County is not. Is not. Yeah. Franklin County is not. Franklin County is not. So in layman's terms, what is that saying about Franklin County to you? So relative to their own proportion, the proportion of incarcerated and non-incarcerated black individuals, so again, that was a calculated, mathematically derived number. So that's just a really important thing to keep in mind. 
um, there was no significantly, statistically significant um, proportional imbalance, I guess, Which, between the two groups. Right. We were yeah, trying. Franklin. Oh, Franklin. Franklin. Same Franklin. thing. Right. Franklin and Franklin are the same. same. It would be in that case. Franklin was a significant difference. So for Franklin County, the observed number of incarcerated black individuals was higher than that mathematically derived proportion would be. For Franklin, for Franklin. it was. For Rutland, it was not. Okay. So <clears throat> what was the mathematically yeah. derived mm -hmm. number? Mm -hmm. What is that replacing? It was a calculated number based on the proportion. What real world number is that trying to replace? The non-incarcerated. Yeah. yeah. So I think so what it kind of goes back to what the the right. legislative. Right. Yeah. Okay. It goes back to what the Joint Justice Legislative Committee wanted, okay. and sort of I think what you were getting at is looking at what the population mm -hmm. of that particular county was, and whether or not there was some sort of imbalance. But because of all the other reasons we just discussed about why it was hard to do that, we could do the calculation instead. Okay. So this is yeah. a. Um, like a benchmark, like, like a way to compare who lives in a county with who is incarcerated in a county? It would be that. It's also, for the kind of data we have, one of the only ways we can run a comparative analysis. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, and just knowing the data that they're using and, and what, you, what I heard in your question, just because, like if I get, well, no, this is the county I live in, I was up in Chittenden earlier today, um, if I get arrested and charged up in Chittenden, but I'm a resident of Washington, I'm still showing up at watch. So it's not measuring what the court in that county is doing, mm -hmm. right? It's just measuring where I, where I live. Okay. So essentially, it's a way for us to have, like you said, a, a metric or a benchmark or a general idea for whether or not a particular county is incarcerating at a proportional or unproportional rate. And based on how you measure this, just say this again, the three counties here, the one of significance is yeah. Chittenden. And what's the significance in Chittenden? Tell me. Have a lower observed proportion of incarcerated black individuals than what would be mathematically expected. And for Franklin County, we had a higher proportion of incarceration. Lower black. expected incarceration rate of people of color. Lower observed than mathematically yeah. expected. The number that we observed <coughs> was lower than what you would expect based on, based on. the proportion that we derived. Boy, I, I made this will make sense more later. I don't know. Do you guys get this? I don't know. I'll move on. It's possible. I, mean, I, don't, I don't understand the math of it. I ne will never. Right. But, but I understand the concept being that there's a mathematical calculation that they did to try yes. to predict how many black people in Chittenden right. County would Should be in jail. Would be yeah. and incarcerated. There, and then the number that they actually observed was lower than what they predicted from you the mathematical I'm calculation. Right, and I, and I don't know how that conclusion squares with like what the sentencing project and all of these things in terms of where, and, and also the demographics of the <coughs> disproportionate of the yeah. people of color. So I just want to also go back to one of the beginning statements that I said and the first chart. And, it, and this is, again, a lot of people were, we are not trying to dispute at all the, that there's a disparity, right? right. I, I want to say right. that very clearly. We recognize that. The numbers show that right here, right? So that's not, we're not trying to do that or argue that point. We sort of go into this um, sort of saying that's a true statement. And then what we're going to do is talk to you a little bit more about what we see in the data for the people who came into incarceration in 2017. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think that I just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware that that's, what, yeah. that's where we're starting Thank you. from. So this is what the software project is. That's Oh, you have. I'm sorry. I didn't yes. My you. question is: What is mathematically expected? Or why this exercise you are doing it? What will help us to see the bigger pictures? How many blacks on jail in comparison to our demography? Why you do this exercise? What kind of education to us to solve the problem? What is the reason we you often, are doing the mathematically expected? We often get asked to um, 
say to say in public meetings like the legislature if there's a difference between certain counties. That's a question that we get asked a lot by other people. Um, I think that if we were usually asked that question, um, just to sort of see if there's you know disparities regionally across the state. Mm -hmm. And so this is one way we were trying to answer that question. And I think there's other ways we can also try and answer it, but that's why we did this question. Does that make sense? Again, we go back to Let's, the fact that the legislature off, has asked us questions that are right. sort of difficult for the Department of Corrections to answer within the scope of the data set that we have and that's right. broader. So we did we did what we could do um, with the with the data set that we had. Can I ask it? People around the table may have asked different questions. Mm -hmm. though, yeah. These are the questions that you were asked by the legislature to yeah. respond to. Is that a fair statement? That is exactly correct. Thank you. Right. So. In traffic stop data, we've struggled with coming up with what is the, if you took out any type of unconscious or conscious bias or any type of improper practice, what would picketing look like in Vermont in terms of racial demographics? Is that what this number is meant to be? Like, is it meant to be like if you took out any sort of um, unconscious or conscious bias or improper sentencing and you just took a look at what you expect the population to look like in jail based on all reasonable reasons to be in jail, is that what the population looks like? That, yes, I wouldn't yeah. say that we could pinpoint, pinpoint the exact expected contribution to all those factors like implicit bias or unconscious bias, but it is accounting all things equal what would the percentage of look like? Okay. What would we expect them to look like? And is that based on that assumption, which is really the best that we can do because we're not able to right. identify all that, which is and it's an, undivi an undeniable point, but we're not able to identify that. So the closest, the best that we can do is holding all things equal, trying to keep what is consistent, consistent. What would our expected proportion be? What do we see? And what's the discrepancy or difference between those two things? Okay. Let's keep going because I think if we get caught that in the math and the algorithm, yeah. it's going to just be <laughs> it's going to be stats one on one for mm -hmm. the next hour. Liz can teach stats. Liz can teach stats one on one if you all want that. Yeah. Several yeah. Years. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Um, table three. Um, is looking at the gender composition of our inmate population, broken down also by race. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what we call a cross tab, breaking down by two categories to give you count data. Um, so the majority of our inmate population identified as male, 83% specifically. Um, of the people who were identified as male, 11% of them were identified as people of color. And of the male individuals who are identified as people of color, 87% of them are identified as black. 17% of our inmate population identified as female. Of those individuals, 4% of them identified as people of color. And 30 of the 41, or 73% of people who identified as women of color, identified as black. Um, we had 22 individuals identified as transgender. Four of them identified as people of color, and one of those four individuals identified as black. So again, we are not making with this data any kind of um, comparative analyses. We're not comparing across groups or between categories. We're just describing what, what we see. And can I just clarify, because you're using the phrase identified as, mm -hmm. and I just want to make sure that my understanding still is that this, what you talked about at the beginning, right. that this yeah. data is collected right essentially by booking officers, and there's no standardized way that they're collecting the information. Correct me if right? I'm wrong, but is there a different process for the identification of gender? People there is category? a different process for gender category. Okay, okay. but I, I guess I'm really referring to race. Yes. Right. So when you say identified as black, that could mean we're the booking officer. We're identifying them as black. Right? They, yeah. they are listed in your system as black. That's correct. Okay. However, so how, whoever identified. came to that conclusion. When I say they identified as male or female, that it does. That's 
and by a different process. Okay. And okay. then we're identified as is implies a, a yeah. separate Yeah, male, process. female, transgender, um, I've actually um, great confidence in those identifications and, and people are asked very clearly how they want to identify and such forms that we fill out. And so, so that's, that's, a clear, that's a much more <laughs> clear process. Yeah. Um, and then those only three categories for gender as well? We actually do make a distinction between transgender, whether or not it's male to female and female to male, but for the purposes of analytic um, processes and ease of reporting and explanation, we collapse across. We what? Collapse across male to female and female to male. Okay, so there's no other... There's no, like, only intersex three categories. or non-binary. There's, there's like, like, 30 plus more genders. Mm -hmm. No, we don't yeah. have those. So on page nine, we also looked at age trends as they related to the racial composition of our incarcerated population. Um, the average, average age of our inmates was 37 years old. Um, there was a fair degree of variability or just our population was very diverse in regards to their age. So it's something to keep in mind. But I will say that this average is pretty consistent with the general population of Vermont. Um, census data from that, age, that year um, reported that the median age of Vermont is all right, looking at the degree of variability, which was about 12 years, we're, we're in the, the range of what you would expect the average Vermonter to, um, to be. So, um, the largest proportion of our inmate population, 35%, was between 30 and 39 years old. Of that group, 30 to 39 year olds, 12% of them um, were identified as people of color. And of the people of color between 30 and 39 years old, 217 identified as, were identified as black. And here we don't for, have part of a breakdown on gender and age. Right? I do not have okay. a breakdown of gender and age in this okay. report. 14% okay. um, of our inmate population uh, were 25 years old or younger. Of that age group or age ranges, 12% of them were identified as people of color. And then 82% of the individuals who are identified as people of color, 25 years old or younger, were identified as black. I did run another test to determine whether or not there was a significant difference in age between black and white incarcerated individuals. And we found that on average, white individuals were older than black individuals, but again, there was a fairly high degree of variability. So our population just looks very diverse in terms of age. And in general, just in terms of, of age over time, um, the population is getting older, right? So right. we've seen a decrease in the number of younger people coming into incarceration and an increase in um, the older population. Thank you. So section two, we looked at crime and sentence length data. I have a couple of caveats for you guys related to this section. The data that we had available to us, again, we did not collect any data for this report. We were drawing on and were limited to what we had <coughs> access to existing data. So for this particular subset of data, we weren't focusing in on one particular year. Like in section one, it was all 2017. This spans in inmates' total time under supervision. We also only used um, data for inmates' most severe charge or the charge of the longest sentence length. That's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at these analyses. Most severe charge or charge with the longest sentence length, which more often than not, violations being probably the exception to that, um, were more, most often um, one and the same. So those two things, those two caveats make sense because it will mm. change the framing of how this can be. Just one more time, sorry. Absolutely. So this, instead of focusing on one year, like our other section did, it spans in and makes total time under supervision. Mm -hmm. So we're still, still taking those people from 2017, right? So it's the same group as in section one. But we had to look back farther, right, in order to get... Well, just their most their severe their most charge severe may have been from a different year. Than from a different year. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So it's using their most severe charge or charge with the longest sentence, which uh, may not Using their most severe be. charge for what, though? Or that they were issued. To do what? To, to look at the to run sentence. 
I see. So the burglary, the burglary things here could range from burglary sentences imposed in 1997 versus. Um, no, it has. It had to have been the charge for which they were still currently incarcerated, right? So we're looking at people in 2017, oh. and then we had to say, okay, let's find out because the question, the underlying question here is, um, is there a difference between charges? that white people are getting and non-white people are getting. Sentences. Sentences, right. Sentences. 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 So Sentences. you're looking at 2017, right. but right. the conviction so we were could have been in 2012. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. So and they're still serving the sentence. That's right. And they're still serving the sentence. Right. So that's why we had to sort of do, we had to go back in time and not just look at. So sentences imposed at different times before different judges, right? Right. Um, okay. well, wouldn't that be really hard to it, do given that <coughs> Charges and sentences get it was very charges hard to get blended yeah. together. <laughs> one it, it was extremely sentence. hard to do, which is why it was practically impossible okay. to do this. And this yeah. was the um, methodology that we came up with in okay. order to provide the committee with yeah. some. <laughs> okay. Tell me something about that. Are you are you uncomfortable with that? Because it sounds it sounds a little cray cray. It sounds cray cray. Well, <laughs> um, what? I mean, I understand that you were told you had to do this, yeah. but I'm also hearing and perceiving by looking at this and running some figures in my head that I'm not sure exactly this shows me something that's entirely probative. Well, I think there are some things in here that are probative, but I think as Liz said in the beginning, it's sort of these kinds of reports usually just result in more questions, and that okay. I think is exactly what happened. Okay. I think it confirmed what we already knew, which is that there's a disproportionate number of black people incarcerated in Vermont. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily think we needed to go through this whole study to nope. do that. I think that um, the legislature had some good intent in sort of trying to understand the reason behind that and the questions that they posed to us. Don't answer. Don't answer. <laughs> don't answer the reason behind it. Right. So we yeah. we, st we still, we're still wondering why. Right. Absolutely. Right. Because the way that they um, yeah, like that's in your conversation. The crafting of the question. So we so we were we were trying to do uh, as best as we could to provide some information so that we didn't um, completely dismiss the request. Right. Like, you know, we needed to submit right. a report. Right. And. Um, spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out what we could do. Um, and I think, you know, it is kind of interesting um, to look at, but it still doesn't really answer the underlying question. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank Does that you. Help you. It makes more it, sense, but if you're yeah. going to explain this to us, can you just do the actuality of like a person so I can actually understand what you're saying with this diagram here that we've got here? Would you mind doing that instead? You mean table five? Yes. Okay. Just so we all are on the same page of what was impossible to do that doesn't really get to the outcome that we want that's been in a t decade conversation about. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, what I was able to do was look at the most frequently issued charges and break that down by inmate ranks. So right here are mm -hmm. some of the most frequently issued charges okay. for our subset of data, which we've already gone into how that's limited. Yeah. But. Um, so, so I'm just going to ask questions along the way. About so, when we're looking at that, what 87 is that? 87 people, 87, 87 people. people. Okay. This so, is. out of and this is 2017 or something. This is using the same group of people mm -hmm. that we've been talking about, but they may not have necessarily been issued that charge in 2017. Can I ask a quick question about that? Because um, when we first started talking about the group of people, I may have misunderstood. This was, were these people who entered into the system in 2017 or everybody who was in jail in 2017? Anyone who came in. Came in. in. Oh. Or who was there. Okay. Was there. Because yeah. like someone who got convicted of something in 2012 but had a 10 year sentence yes, still in jail in 2017. Yes, so they're counted. They're counted. Okay. Because I at first understood you to mean like people who were newly entering the system in 2017, yeah. but that's not right. It's okay, so that explains. Was incarcerated okay. at any point in time. Okay, so that's why someone yeah. 
is in this data who has a conviction from 2012 or whatever. Got it. Thank you. I think one thing on this chart, one of the challenges in this chart, and especially for folks who don't spend a lot of time in criminal court, but correct me if I'm also mischaracterizing one of your challenges. One of the issues is that a lot of people get sentenced to concurrent sentences. Mm -hmm. They're facing multiple charges. So they get concurrent sentences, and the most severe sentence controls the whole thing. So, at, so as far as DOC is concerned, all DOC has to know to carry out their job is what the long sentence is. And that's what controls how long that person's in there. Uh, but the reality is there's uh, these other charges next to it that just kind of got folded in. So it's very hard for DOC to look at their data and say that such and such charge resulted in a sentence unless it was the controlling sentence, unless it was the biggest charge. So there's a bunch of information that DOC isn't going to have. We could, I think you'd have to go back to the court files and look at exactly and what I think Robin has a lot to say about the sentencing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, honestly. you guys actually go to the rap sheets and ma'am, to go to your uh, concern about 10 years later, whether that sentence is concurrent or not gets transmitted to DOC on the mitmus on a piece of paper. That's the exact same way it gets transmitted to VCIC where your rap sheets are and all sorts of stuff. Now, now VCIC puts it into a nice format for me so I can extract it and, and do data analysis. But whether that sentence is concurrent is transferred on paper. Do you want an example? Like, yeah, okay. I want you to. So let's Joe. say my client Joe gets is charged with domestic assault um, for assaulting his intimate partner, um, unlawful mischief for damaging his partner's phone while this fight is going on, and then resisting arrest when the police show up and want to arrest him. Um, he might end up. Let's say the resisting arrest gets dismissed and he pleads guilty to the domestic assault and the unlawful mischief. Um, and on the domestic assault conviction, he gets a sentence of 12 to 24 months to serve. Um, and then he, on the unlawful mischief, which is a much, like, has a lower maximum possible sentence, it's a lesser misdemeanor <coughs> than domestic assault, he gets a zero to three month sentence and it's run at the same time, so concurrently. So he goes to jail, and technically he's serving two sentences, but the, but the controlling sentence is the 12 to 24 months, because it's clearly longer. So he, technically he's serving zero to three months on that unlawful mischief at the same time that he's serving the 12 to 24 month sentence on the domestic assault. And you, as I understand what you're saying, is you are using that controlling sentence, the harsher, yes. longer sentence, mm -hmm. as for your doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that the question is, why are people in jail? Right. What's for the, what are the right. crimes that you're keeping in there? And in this case, it's like all of those, but really it was the assault. So relevant yeah. to, to this chart is the reason Joe's in jail is really for a domestic assault conviction, right? Because he's got the, so he's serving out 24 months. Um, and then, you know, what's Joe's race as compared to everybody else who's serving a domestic assault conviction? And also, like, how does Joe's sentence, let's say Joe's black, how does Joe's sentence compare to some white guy who also got convicted of domestic assault um, the same year or whatever? Which will have a ton of caveat for me to get to that mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Um. <laughs> so does that mean, I'm going to try to ask this question now because I don't even know if it's an actual question. Um, so when I look at this, it makes me think, I don't know if I'm reading this right, but it makes me think, okay, proportionally white folks are in jail more, hence because we're the second whitest state in the nation. So by default, we're, we're going to assume that's happening and that's what's reflected everywhere and including in this chart. And what I see is that out of that, still there's a disproportionate in black folks in every category that it looks like we've talked about, yet it's much low, significantly lower up here and so if that is the case, it makes me concerned that if they're not being charged with those, then what are they being charged with? So not only the fact that, yay, they, they, didn't, take, they didn't do 87 of the burglaries and were charged for that, only 11, but was there something even more egregious that they were charged with? And the burglary wasn't it. So what are all these? I'm just wondering if all these are a good low 
Or are they low because they actually got bumped into more egregious charges or more whatever, not good, whichever word you want to use, is what I'm sort of wondering when I look at these numbers of like domestic assault, so it didn't end up being a domestic assault, what did it end up being with attempted murder? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So those are the questions I'm sort of having, and I don't know if that goes on in your report, but. I don't think that's something that we're able to answer, right? With yeah, this that particular number seems yeah. interesting of how I'm, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. trying to mm -hmm. think about it in my head. And I think the question goes to one of the parts of the issue yeah. here, which is if the sentencing data doesn't show a clear Disparity, right. but there is a clear disparity. What's the other? Yeah. What's the other? What's the other? Right. So some yeah. of the things yeah. might be exactly what you're yeah. talking about, yeah. which is are people getting assigned different charges when prosecutors make decisions? Are they getting convicted of different charges? Because that stuff could really play in. So you know, if the sentences aren't that disparate, mm -hmm. then it's possible that people of color are getting assigned to two sentences that are harsher, uh, or getting charges, charges, charges yeah, yeah. that are harsher. And therefore, maybe they're serving sentences that are the same as other charges, but white people would have, for the similar behavior, would have gotten lesser charges. So I think it's a good comment, and it's exactly, it goes to the heart, it's exactly what the committee was right. trying to struggle with. I want to make sure I understand mm -hmm. Sheila's point. Um, so like, so you've, how did you, well, so you chose the most frequently charged offenses. So we most took severe charge. we took inmates' most severe charge or the charge with the longest sentence. No, I understand Only that. Only use that data, and then of the most severe charges, we reported the most frequently issued. The most frequently issued charges. However, so there like, is a complete index. Yeah. Okay. Appendix D. Okay. Every single one of them. Okay. Because as okay. I, if I'm understanding okay. Sheila's point correctly, she's suggesting that. So, like, attempted is attempted murder. No, so and so, like, if someone <laughs> might money. have been charged with domestic assault, like, we can't tell if more white people are charged with domestic assault, whereas for the same conduct, a uh, person yeah, of color might be charged with murder. murder. So that's, you know, to what David yeah. said, this is what sort of happened yeah. when, we took, when we went over this with the, um, Justice Oversight Committee, which is all a lot of those decisions right. are made at a different point, and the data that we're looking at is the end of the line. Mm -hmm. Decisions have already been made at this point. So those discretionary things, are just they're oh. just not going to be covered here at all. Right. Yeah. There's and really two significant discretionary points: right. the initial charge, right, which yeah. is in the hands of the state's that's attorney, that's and good. then as you get towards the end, before the sentence, right, it's what plea agreement is offered, which would perhaps, again, the state's attorney control the charge, the court does right. And you've got to remember that 90 to 95% of all the criminal cases going through the system are resolved right. through plea agreements. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. So that's, there that's how these, yeah. these numbers get there. Can, can I ask, a, oh. can, I, just, I, I have a really response to what you just said, because I'm a yes and. Um, you, you said that the state's attorney is the charging body, and um, we've talked about the influence of police officers from the get-go with identifying with their affidavits, mm -hmm. with ex their relationships with the state's attorney, ex I can go on and on and on, that actually go into those charges. Yes. So I, I want us to be mindful around the table of that language because we, we keep on going back and forth of when is the uh, most... Um, impactful points, like discretionary points is I guess the other terminology we're using. And we have to remember it's from the absolute beginning. Mm -hmm. And I know what you're saying. I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I just, I want to make sure we're just really clear with that because when we say it's up to the state's attorney, I, I, I don't think we should use that language anymore because it's really I'm trying. I understand what spectrum. you're saying. I agree with you. I was trying to distinguish the sentencing point from points before that, that where the discretion is exercised long before sentencing. Mm -hmm. Right. Sentencing is, as someone said, is the end of the line, um, and that's what we're looking at. We're looking at data of people who have been convicted. To really understand the process, you've got to go back to uh, charge, agree agreement charge, and the arrest, as you said. So it's that discretion all along the way. You've been waiting. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I think, um, 
I, and I feel uh, for Monica often. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I do. Um, and then, Bond in here. <laughs> and, it's, you know, it, and it's that the Department of Corrections is probably the least qualified to answer the questions that, that people want to have answered. And I, and I, and I, and you know, seriously. I, you, you mean it in a different way. I mean it in a different way. way. <laughs> I mean it in a different way. I really love it. Right, like the questions that people want answered, and, and it's in all their caveats. I will say that we do have right. a federal grant that's probably not going to be completed by the time you need to file a report. Um, that's going to start with DOC data, but work all the way backwards through the NIBRS data and the police data. Um, and because I can track people through the system, or I can track incidents through the systems. And NIBRS is a national incident-based reporting system and gives us a wealth of information about things that aren't captured in other places in the data. So what kind of fire, what kind of weapon was used, what kind of injury was there. Um, I don't get some things that, you know, like whether the victim's going to participate in the process, which may affect how things go forward. But I will get a lot more rich data um, about the circumstances of the offense that brought this person into incarceration. I am the people who, and since I'm starting with incarceration, I'm not going the other way, like who doesn't? But I will be able to answer, did someone with a similar situated um, intimate partner violence with the same level of injury recorded in the same type of, of you know, criminal history record, both in state and out of state, did they end up in the same spot? Um, but that's, you need to, to answer some of these questions, we need to, to go back, as you were saying, all the way to the police um, and what data can we get out of those structured systems uh, to help you answer those questions? I will, oh, go ahead. I will say, in just response to that, I think that that is an absolute necessity. We aren't able to identify the mechanisms that underlie a lot of why this is showing us. But the good thing about starting at the end of the line, while it doesn't answer those questions, is it allows us to have directed focus or pointed attention to the areas which yeah. it allows us to identify okay, mm -hmm. these are the areas that we need to go back and identify where the where, trajectory. Yeah. Right. So there is some merit to looking at mm -hmm. what we already see is the, the proof of existence. So going back and then not knowing what the actual situation is, having yeah. directed focus on where to yeah. look for mechanisms that might be contributing to why we see that. So there's merit in looking at this as well. And I appreciate Robin's comment because it, it is true that oftentimes the Department of Corrections is um, asked to answer a fair, uh, a number of questions about the criminal justice system because, you know, in some cases we do have data and some of our data is really appropriate for the question and in this case it, it's really not. Um, um, Can I ask a question? I mean, in your data, can you find out on the reports that an individual policeman is arresting more blacks or stopping more blacks than white. Not because we, we, we have to agree on the police department, not everybody's racist, but on the police department there is racism and they are racist policemen. They might do it and this is where the increase happened. If you don't put it and study it as a data and find where is what you call bad apple, we're not going to stop it. That's not available in our data, but there are other. Excuse me? That's not available in our data, but there's other research around that's directed towards answering that question. So, and we can't speak to that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe our state officer can. So your question is. That. Like in your office, yeah, you, yeah. It, some officer, they stopping more police, uh, more more black people of colors than other policemen. Mm -hmm. You know, they are stopping them by the car, they are arresting them, they are searching their cars unlawfully, etc. The more stopping the blacks on the car, the more a problem you're going to find. You're going to find that if you stop every white person you're going to find the same average. Mm -hmm. So, do you see certain officer in your office bringing you more blacks than whites? Um, well. Uh, this is major question. Yeah, this is, but this is, um, well, we, we track the data of car stops in our department, and other departments are 
mandated to do the same thing. There's state law that requires every department to collect um, the perceived race of the operator of, of every car they stop, and then departments hold that data and make it public. So it can be known how many, uh, what the racial demographic is of the car stops of every single department. Of the people arrested or the people arresting? Um, so well, a car stop may lead to an arrest or may not, and that's tracked as well. But the data is that's tracked is starts with car stops, and some of those lead to arrests. But if you're talking about improper conduct, yes, 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 then that's handled um, through, you know, internal affairs investigations and and um, you know. I guess I'm not entirely sure what your question I, I is. I think he's asking if I can. Please. Is the identity, the ethnicity of the person stopped as opposed to the police officer. In other words, he's trying to track. Am I correct in saying? It's more like if a certain police officer right. is uh, stopping more a black driver, mm -hmm. arresting more, finding more of, of blacks than other, uh, other officers within so the average of the population. So I'm assuming with the data that the major's talking about, they can identify the stops and the perceived uh, and, and the officer in the yeah. officer yeah. certainly and the officer yes, yes. yes. yeah and it's all public it's mm -hmm. all public mm -hmm. and it says the officer is oh, how okay. many blacks they are arresting each one mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I, don't I don't think officer details is well the officer detail isn't public but, they but, we, the but the departments know yeah, the sure officers yeah. yes yeah. yes but there uh, you you're aware of the of the data has been a lot of data has been ordered collected or, or required to be collected. The legislature passed that requirement. How long is? 2014. 2014, yeah. which actually is a, is a great uh, point for us to consider because you have now, since 2014, had enough data to then, well, not enough, but data that <coughs> we don't necessarily have from the DOC or the judiciary or the attorneys. I'm offices. sorry, let me tell you a small story. I own a store in Colchester. A black person came in and tried to attack me at night, right? And to steal from me. I put him back, locked him in, he got arrested. The moment they arrested him, they found the three women inside the car waiting for him. The three women are white, right? And he found drugs on it. When I went to the court, because the court called me, you know, to be a witness. They said, what do you want from him? All these questions, after they finished any question, I said, what happened to the three women? Because at least one of them came and looked at the store before he entered. They said, there is no three women. You mean in your report, never been reported? No, nothing. Even though I know the first day, second day, from the investigation that they arrested the three women, or they found the three women, one of them is a driver. Later, the officer came in. I said to the court, I'm not going to be a witness. The officer came in, and he said, well, the only person I can arrest is the person behind the wheel. I said, OK. He said, well, she's mentally not all together. She wasn't coherent. She was drugged, etc." I said, now you are a social scientist and psychologist, and she's poor, she doesn't have anything. And they decided not to make a report of it, OK? The chief of police of Colchester, I said, no way, you know. They didn't report it. There is no, no report about those three people. Only they want the guy they arrested at the beginning. Even though they, when they stopped the car, they found the three of them, mm -hmm. right? with the blood, with everything from the person who broke in. So there is racism on this story. You cannot tell me there isn't. We got the black guy, we let the three assistants, they are white women, you know? So how are you going to collect data like this? Yeah, three points. One, I'm in agreement with you. The greatest disparity is at the first point of contact. 
I will tell one small little war story, which was three weeks ago. I got stopped for going four miles an hour below the speed limit in a school zone. Okay, that's my personal record. Now, I will simply say that I wasn't all that polite at that point. But the thing on the table here is corrections. I'm not disagreeing yeah. with you at all. I think the disparity you need to look at is inter with different departments, different police departments in the state, because there's, <coughs> there's a huge variance. And despite the fact that I'm from the state police, I think they're the best and working hardest on it. And that's really not biased. I just know more about them than other departments, which I have no good words for. The question here I'd like to hear is, and I don't know the, I don't know the point to discover it, the difference in the length of incarceration <clears throat> for similar or identical crimes. And that's what I want the Department of Corrections to tell me. Mm -hmm. And to what Robin's point is, is that sentence, that's not data that we can accurately describe. And that's, yeah. the, that's the issue. That's what people wanted to know, and that's what the when legislature they, they, Can I ask just to be, to be educated, where can that be found? So we did mm -hmm. do a study a few years ago on that, the, and the legislature again asked us to answer that question. Was there a disparity in the length of sentence um, and the type of sentence? And um, what we found was that and we had to choose, what I did is I chose a sample. I, one, I had to choose a, a crime where I had enough people of color committing it. Um, and there is a disparate, um, right, in, in that. Um, so I chose assault, domestic, a possession of coke, and then possession of marijuana, uh, which was a crime at the time. And looked at those four crimes where I had a sufficient enough non-white population to, to look at. Um, and we used as variables the in-state records, we pulled the out-of-state records from um, the FBI. We tried the best we could to mimic the decision-making process that the defense attorney and the, and the judge and the prosecutor go through. I did not have access at that point to victim data and who participated and so on and so forth. So other things that, that go into that decision. And what we found is it was really those out-of-state records drove the decision to incarcerate. Okay. And when I looked at those out-of-state records, and I've practiced in other states and stuff like that, when I look at those out-of-state records, they are not like our in-state records. Uh, you know, there was a lot of armed robbery. There was a lot of aggravated. Yeah, but I know, bet there was a lot of plain view marijuana in New York City too. Right, right? And, and, and that I, and that gets to my next point, know. sir, is that um, in those out-of-state records is baked into everything that NYPD has ever done wrong and unconstitutional and the Rampart Division, and, and we, right, we can go through almost every major metropolitan police department that has been sued or under a consent decree for its racist practices, and those convictions are baked in there. You're absolutely correct. Um, and until the state or somebody starts just, you know what, any arrest in NY in New York City during these years, well, if you're under a consent decree, we're not gonna look at. You know, um, yes, so people are making decisions based right. on that, absolutely. Thank you. I apologize for being aggressive, but I'm kind no, of aggressive. No, you know? no, no. <laughs> and so we're certainly well happy to go through and describe a lot of these other tables to you, mm -hmm. but I think that the, the point that people are coming to understand uh, mm -hmm. is that our data doesn't answer the questions that, that people right. really wanted to ask. And so, I mean, we, we did, we, we could do the best that we could here. Yeah. And so I just don't know if, it makes sense, or how you want to proceed. Well, so. I, there are a couple things that I'm thinking of right now. Um, one is I know poor Rebecca, we've had you like sitting and waiting to this commentary that we've been waiting for for about the Defender General's response to this report. And I'm but it only Rebecca makes sense once this is you know, when this when is when we hear from you fully right. everything you want to say. And then you go, oh then, well, it's not really. Well, right. you, know, you, you said something today that was was interesting. You said that. Although you're, you're, you're first in line to recognize the limitation, you said that there were some things that were appropriate. I, I think you said you used the word appropriate. But what were those? Like what, were, what are the conclusions you think are fair? And I'd like to hear, you know, that given mm -hmm. the known and recognized limitations. Unless you didn't mean that. 
Well, I mean, I think what I meant was that the, it, 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 in terms of probing into different areas, and what yeah. we told the committee when we testified on this, that there are things that, sort of back to what Sheila was talking about mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. there are discretion points of the Department of Corrections and decisions that we make internally that are just our decisions. And if those are the types of questions people want to ask us mm -hmm. in terms of disciplinary reports, segregation, mm -hmm. yeah. release on furlough, mm -hmm. those are the types of questions people should be asking mm -hmm. us. When it comes to these types of questions, who gets charged, what sentences do they get, why do people get arrested differently, those are not the kinds of questions to ask the department of questions. And that, so if people want to ask us those questions, and we recognize and we're actually just trying to figure out a way Yeah. Is that, is that, what that report is? No, it's not. No, because that's not what we were asked to do. We're asked to describe our population. And we, and we, we did. Yeah. I, Ingrid, why don't you go, and then I would like to take a few minutes, because I actually have something that's pretty big in terms of where we go next that I think we have to talk about, even though we have this still hanging over us. Go ahead. Maybe you've answered this already, but you combined the folks that are serving conviction, serving sentence on a conviction, and people that are just there because they were held without bail, pre-conviction. So in in section, not in Article Five. I, I don't mean yeah. that, but just yeah. in the whole in the whole group. Yeah. But do you have the numbers somewhere in here that say that the total numbers of people who are convicted and the total number? Of people who are pre-conviction. I mean, we can, we can absolutely be able to. That detainee population, yeah, that's Jurassic, yeah, runs, mm -hmm. historically runs about 400 people a day for the last 10 years. Okay. And the last time we, yeah. we've done some yeah. snapshots, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. a table of 400 yeah. people, yeah. usually 50 yeah. are federal prisoners okay. that were mm -hmm. held in our facilities. Of the remaining, uh, the last time we did it, about half of them were held on um, without bail situations, in other words, serious felonies, the next tier down, okay. where felonies with, with, with significant monetary bail. The times we've done it, we ended up with about 20, 25, at most 25 misdemeanor offenses um, that were held for lack of bail, but you then have to go into the individual court records to find out what that really means, because oftentimes you'll have somebody in there on a misdemeanor offense with a bail, of, uh, so let's say a nominal bail, $100. But they may be there because they're on a violation of probation um, or on a furlough escape and they've been picked up and they want credit for, they're out on furlough, they've escaped, they grab something at a store, so they're charged with petty larceny, um, break the window getting in so it's unlawful mischief. They might have a small amount of bail so they're really being detained because of the furlough status, but they'll set bail on them to get credit for time served on the new offense. So even though there's a small number of misdemeanor offenses where the bail is imposed, unless you drill into the individual case, you can't really tell why they're there. Okay. So the and detainee I just, population about I just want to make sure I understand your question though. So we have done um, lots of analysis specifically on the detention population. And we, ha we can look and see what the racial um, breakdown is in that group and sort of what they're, you know, what they're being charged with at the time. And I can't, and I have to go back and look, because we did, again, we, it was this same study that Judge Gerson is referencing, and quite honestly, I did it months ago, so I don't remember everything that was in there. But I guess my question is really just because it seems like if you merge those populations and do analysis of both, that it gets, in my mind, it would be confusing because there are people who are being detained maybe just for a day or until the next court mm -hmm. time, and then there are people who are serving sentences, and people could be detained for any number of reasons like you just specified, and it could... And so it's sort of like the racial demographic of who's detained and the racial demographic of who's serving sentence are telling me different things, but I could be wrong. No, you know? no yeah. I, I think yes, I think that makes sense. And I we often look at the differences okay. between sentence and detained, but we just didn't do it in the report. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times when I'm doing things, I always break them out because I don't want to confuse the two. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Just 
Okay. <laughs> and then I need to go. All right. Uh, so if DLC was not the agency that should have been asked to do this, what agency should have been? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that question because I, I feel it. I wasn't, I'm not really sure exactly. I mean, we put the actual charge and the questions, this is verbatim what the mm -hmm. legislature right. asked, asked us to do. And but the tactical error was that. And, but, I, but I'm not really sure what their underlying question was either. Yeah. And we, we, got to to we, don't, we didn't get at, we didn't get, we were involved in the conversation as to uh, when, the, as, when this got put in statute. And so I, I wasn't there for the conversation. I don't really know. There isn't one state agency that answered this And, and I don't think there's one state. I think it has to be a joint kind of like looking at it together. Although I do think um, the crime research group study that Robin referenced is going to probably is going to be one of the more comprehensive yes. questions that we've ever had before, mm -hmm. and so I think that's really interesting to see what they come up with, give them some time, and then look at that report. And I don't know, you said it wasn't going to be done. Was I'm still waiting on the FBI. Okay. To oh, the, oh, the FBI. Um, but I, I, I do feel like that's a that's a, that's a report that's going to combine a lot of data from a bunch of people. Probably one agency or one department shouldn't be pinpointed. me where I want to go. If you will allow me, I'm really, I don't want to stop this because this is really organic. On the other hand, there are a couple issues that have come up since this report was released that need to be addressed by this panel. And I want to put them out there because it directly affects ways forward that we can or cannot choose to take. I am aware at this point now that the report that we need to produce has to be done earlier than we had initially imagined. If you remember, when we first were discussing this, we thought we had until 2020. That is, in fact, not the case. Um, apparently, um, the committee that considered the DOC report wants this report more quickly and we should proceed post haste. I am not exactly sure what the new timeline is. I'm looking at you because you were there. There is no timeline. All there is is a sense of urgency. OK. Let's just deal with the sense of urgency. OK. I like that. That's just so helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I guess we're going to combine as much possible completeness with quickness as we can. Um, and we're going to probably miss a lot, I think, with this report. Um, given that there's urgency, I feel like we need to strike while the iron's hot. I've been told by other people who are not in this room that that is, in fact, the case. Um, and we really should get something down, even if it is not complete. To, and we should bear in mind here, it doesn't have to be complete. It's not the only time a report is produced by this panel. Um, so I have a proposal to make, and I'd like you to understand I'm not dictating this, but I'm merely suggesting it as a way forward. In doing so, I hope to use everyone's time as efficiently as possible and to get some relevant and productive writing for the report accomplished in this new time frame that is just urgent. Um, so the idea that I have has to do with the report that Chief Don Stevens disseminated that we all rather liked. I think it provides a good framework. Whether it's a perfect framework or not, who the hell knows? Who cares? It works. Um, I think we should take it. It um, provides a good framework for what, according to statute, is in fact the body of the report that we will create. There, it will, if we follow it, allow us to make full recommendations for approaching racial disparity in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Um, we've been discussing the report a lot, even while we discussed what we should do with 6A, you'll recall. Um, at that point, we had the luxury of time, which we now no longer have. Um, the discussion, for what I think are obvious reasons, has taken a while. Um, 
no doubt that it will produce some concrete ideas, I think, for reform. Um, but I think we have to speed along. What I was told was there's a soft deadline, in fact, of 2019 and not 2020. That's what I've when, been given. What month? 2019. Isn't that fun? One wonder. I, told, I was told it's not January, but don't think it's July. Well, I would think it's the legislative session. Yeah, right. there's urgency, they want to do something. And, and right. let's be, and when is crossover? <laughs> right, which is, uh, right. When which is the last is, hour of crossover? Yeah. Right. Is, well, right. it changes, March. but it's usually going to be that second week in March after I, right. day. Right. So I would suggest the following, um, and again, suggesting, um, that we keep approaching that report with the same process that we've been using to consider it, namely, each agency or organization reads the part or parts of the report that directly pertains to them. But, as I suggested at that, I was going to say last meeting, but God only knows when that was at this point, thanks Snow, we would make concrete recommendations based upon the thoughts and observations that the reading provokes. I would suggest that everyone group up as it were. Group up. Bless you. The coming group debates. So are you talking about the, um, the specific re this specific report? The, um, reducing reducing racial disparities in the, yes. Okay, I just want to make sure yes. we're talking about So divide, we, yes. divide ourselves based on our area we want to focus on. And Which we were doing. Right. Justice, regional justice. Which we were doing when we were reading it, and people were coming in and saying, This really resonated for me in this way, and these are some thoughts that this, I mean, Pepper was really good at that at our last meeting of bringing forth some ideas that were actually very concrete um, about what we might do. I would suggest again that we group up and turn attention not away from observations and ideas but also to these concrete recommendations, because at some point, that's going to have to come through. Um, these should be recommendations for what, in your various agencies and organizations, would help to create less racial dispari disparity than presently exists. They may also be preventative. Okay? This group discussion that we're having is absolutely great, but I think what happened at the last meeting the last time we talked about 6A was we found it really didn't produce a lot in the terms of concrete recommendations. It was very interesting. Um, I remember saying, this is a really great discussion, but we really need to have some concrete recommendations. And it was like I had dropped the large appliance in the middle of the room and everybody stopped talking. Oh. <laughs> it was like, OK, well, the refrigerator fell. Let's just all go home yeah. now. Um, and I'm hoping to get around that. Um, it was great talk. It really was great talk. But there was very little in the way of points that could be noted in a report. And that troubled me, given what our mandate is. By gathering an agency or organization-specific groups, the way that we were reading this report that Chief Stevens gave us, we can make these points without the inefficiency of my trying to micromanage that which I do not necessarily understand. I'm just going to be honest about that. Um, I would suggest that it would be a better use of everyone's time. So I would like these smaller groups to meet when they can, in whatever way they can, perhaps through email, perhaps through actual face-to-face, -face, whatever works, phone conversations, Skype. Y'all know things I don't know about this. Um, and then make lists. And I would say lists that are, in fact, bullet pointed. That they, you can then email to me. And then I will do with it what I did with 6A, which is I'll start writing. And then I will send that writing back to you all. And you will tear it apart. And you will say, this works, this doesn't work. I like this, I like that. Is this a perfect solution? No. But I don't think we have the luxury of looking for something that is absolutely 
stunning that we're all going to say, oh, this is really going to be fabulous. Um, we don't have the time to really look for that, I don't think. Um, I will send that out and we'll hammer it through and we'll meet again and we'll do exactly what we did, as I say, with 6A. Um, I, can, you, can I interrupt? Which, uh, what are we answering, not 6A? Which no, is, we're gonna go through the report that Chief Stevens yeah. gave us. Everyone's gonna read it according to what actually is specific to their agency or organization. Yeah. Make bullet points, send them to me, okay. I'm gonna write. Hey Tom, I would just add that I, have ideas in other organizations. Ooh, Great. So we don't have just an okay. insider's identity. And I would invite everyone to be Great. able to do that. Yeah. If you have, if you have, especially for folks who are not coming from state. Yeah, from Wonderful. State. And then, and that was another, that's right. like my last point is, okay. here's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was the problem. Um, my suggestion would then be then send them to me anyway. And you'll compile them. And I'll compile. So we're going to start with Chief's report. I think we should start with that as a framework. That's my suggestion. By framework, I mean you mean sort of like an outline of all the different yes. um, departments, so to speak. Exactly. That it identifies as being involved in the program. Exactly. Yes. And I'm feeling that even more strongly given this discussion that we're having right now and where we just ended with this, where Curtis was actually saying, where, was it Curtis? I'm losing it now. Um, sure, what organization, who would do this? Who should be the person who should answer these questions? And then you said, it's really gotta be a multi-pronged response. I think this gets to that. Um, I have to say, as I'm putting it out here, I'm going, oh my God, this is gonna be messy as hell. Um, okay. I'm willing to take that risk if the rest of you are. Can I, can I follow up on your suggestions? Um, Please do. I mean, so I had the same thought that Rebecca did, which is like, should we really all be listing what we think our own agencies need right. to do? And I, I suppose some introspection is, is good and helpful, but I also think, for example, like I might have thoughts on what the state police mm -hmm. do, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, not that I'm anti-group, although one of the hardest things about groups can be just the logistics of making it happen. Indeed. But as you were starting to talk, my thought was, why doesn't every individual person just come up with their bullet list? Okay. Like, of as many, about as, like, using the framework of the report that <coughs> Chief Don shared with us. Yes. Whatever agency or department or section of the criminal justice system you feel like you have thoughts about, about okay. what, it, what it could do to be addressing racial disparities. Why can't each one of us come up with our, our own list? Absolutely. I was simply responding <laughs> to the fact that nobody wanted to read 74 pages. <laughs> well, you don't um, necessarily have to. Right. You can right. pick which ones yes. you want to. Okay. Um, that's my thought. Sounds okay. great. And I'm offering to compile. And I think that's a great idea. And I think that instead of having a speak with you, we can have um, accountability buddies. Because yeah. I think that we don't just uh, have to have a group, but it's good to call up and say, hey, Jess, um, did you get <laughs> did to you even the first more? 10 pages of the thing? <laughs> and write and hold each other accountable. Yeah. Talk about what you were maybe seeing or thinking, be able to go off of each other. So there's at least another sounding board Great. of a person. I think that we should do that as individuals based on our own experiences and expertise. And we should do that with some accountability from somebody in this group that has a different perspective that might challenge us or have us look at things a different way. And Fine. be like, hey, so why were you thinking that? Or what, why are you having trouble reading the document? Fine. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the situation is, I think, would be helpful, and then it wouldn't be um, trying to put five people's Skypes together. Sounds great. Just call each other up or Skype or whatever. Sounds <laughs> great. <clears throat> I am just throwing that out there, folks, because I just yeah. feel like we need to. I like everybody's suggestion. I like the idea of sounding boards, accountability buddies. I think that would be. So I just want to throw another recommendation since the legislature or this committee, Joint Justice Oversight, indicated some interest from this committee, I think, 
and hearing where we were at. Do they meet monthly? They meet Judge? tomorrow. They, they meet, meet tomorrow. And then they won't meet won't, again. This, their last this is their meeting. last session. And then they before go to the regular last meeting. And last meeting it's going before directly the to the committees right. if they oh. want to go there. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there are, are opportunities to try to get on the agenda wherever we think is appropriate. And maybe you can have some ideas for us in terms of, and, and so that you can provide <coughs> an update or feel out. Um, where, where, when, but it sounds like we're moving forward, which I love, too, so. Okay. There are ways for you, us, through you, representing us, to get before the legislature in this session, is my point. That's okay. right. Um, so identifying the right so committee, really and getting on the agenda, right. yeah. and <coughs> getting them and sharing an update yeah. on what we are doing. And Great. Getting direct feedback from the legislators. Okay. Right. And I'm happy to work with you to facilitate getting you conversations directly with the House of Senate leadership. So thank that you. would be lovely. Right. They would best like that. to hear from I you would, and us. I would, I would be more than willing. Yeah, it strikes me as the judiciary committees, but is there something else, House Senate? That makes the most sense, but they do also occasionally have joint meetings yeah. here yeah. and some things yeah. like that. So I, I, maybe Tim and Mitzi have ideas about how they want yeah. to hear about this, and mm -hmm. I think having Eton work with them directly would be a good way to Great, more than willing. Um, anyway, as I say, I didn't want to interrupt the organic flow of the conversation, but I also wanted to direct us in a certain direction, given what our mandate is. The other question I had was how we have very overlapping, not completely overlapping, um, mandates with the newly created. Um, oh, right. That's right. Who was also identified problem. <laughs> and uh, I talked to Karen Richards. Uh -huh who's on, the, on that body, and she, I said, I think there ought to be some liaison going on here between us and you. And Karen went, I think that's a great idea. First we have to write the um, job description, and then after we write the job description, we'll talk about doing that and having somebody, me or somebody coming and talking to them and having somebody from them coming and talking to us. So that, in fact, will happen. I see you're still hiring. Right, the job position yes. for the executive director. Has listed, yes. I yeah. think, hasn't yes. it? It has been listed. Oh, it has been listed. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm, writing. I'm writing a letter for someone, someone, so, yeah. yeah. It, it, January, so it closes. It closes. But, but, it's um, closed. but they say, as soon as that, <clears throat> the dust is cleared from that, they want to talk about liaison with, with this body, mm -hmm. um, given that we're all doing and hoping for the same things. Um, so that that's what I also wanted you to know. I also have met, um, I guess I should put in here, with um, the ACLU. They had some interesting criticisms of the report that I was sort of like, Oh, we're full Interesting. Of that. Pardon? <laughs> you know, long letter. Yeah, we yeah, letter. and I just kind of, I, um, I mean, I. This I, report? This yes. Report. And I, I was Sorry. given a, um, I, I, woefully inadequate was the term around the data sets. So I wrote and said, that's interesting. What would a non woefully inadequate data set look like? Just curious. Which led to a really great conversation. And um, I'm not ready to go through the whole thing yet because I'm still processing what they said. I took like lots of notes. And again, it was like before the snowstorm, so I've like lost everything, but it's there. Um, but one of the things that went on, they were also, um, that wouldn't it be nice if these kinds of reports happened more frequently, cited places like Oregon and Rhode Island that do them, I believe, quarterly. Um, and I was sort of saying, well, if that's too much, you know, is there like biannually? I mean, it was a discussion. <coughs> and, was, I would, and, and certainly the ACLU would then uh, regular communication with us and asking and for data, which we which we provide. Um, I haven't heard that particular request from them, and I'd be curious what the reports are that they're referencing. I will get them days. and forward them. And yeah. Monica, yeah. they had the same conversation with me, and I showed them your public website and the public data that's all there on, yeah. the, on the public website. Yeah. Um, as far and I, I sat with them for a while and, and went through and how to use your website. That was really nice of you, Robin. Well, I was doing a whole bunch of other yeah. stuff. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
I hope I wasn't stepping on anyone's toes. I was just trying to move things along. Oh no, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, just, no, absolutely I, not. Yeah, I'm just curious. I just so, wanted to let I just wanted to let you know that you know we do have regular right. communication with the ACLU and okay. and provide them quite honestly lots and lots of other data that they request specifically from us. Okay. Um, so I've been madly I, going through my email search here looking for something from Chief Stevens. I, I've got the work he did on 6A, but was there I can find a report? I had to send the report again. He, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. not sure I have that either because he started crafting something. I, that we would do. I yeah. Would you broadcast that? Uh, I'll, I'll send it out. So yeah. I wasn't the only one. Or are you just no, talking about this? He, he shared, I, my understanding when you're, you're referencing a report is he's sharing a report that was compiled by the National Science Center. Oh, I have that. Yeah. 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 This is the report you sent like that. I will do that. Okay. I will. Yes, that's what we're talking about. And I will. I will get that. I'll get that out again for those who need that. I will. And yes. I will send that out again too in case anyone looks for it. It was sent out, I remember, October 26th. Um, but I'll send it out again. Um, I would only add that while we're in this organic process of brainstorming points, that if you find other useful resources, not just this one report, to share it with us. Please. You know, we're all trying to spun up, you know, because you're on the same page as Mr. Castro. Okay. Um, I would hope <coughs> that one of the recommendations would be that the current research group takes on the position of data czar. <laughs> Usually I get called Data Diva, but I'll say czar. No, Diva would be good. Right. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Um, and if it's helpful to the committee, I can actually, because I read some of your minutes, I've read them all. I can tell you all the current studies that we have going on and how we mm -hmm. plan mm -hmm. to look at, at racial disparity in these various studies that run everything from what I've talked about to uh, something that we're, we're evaluating diversion, we're doing stuff mm -hmm. with. Uh, Lund Family Center and, and Child Welfare and, and all sorts of other stuff. So I can write up a list. And it might be good for you to come and present to us. Yeah, be on our agenda. Okay. Be on our agenda. I'm going to Thailand. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, no break. How long? For two weeks. And oh, no. Oh, yeah, you're oh, back yeah. Before no, no, no. Well, yeah, 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 we're not going to meet another two weeks. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll show you pictures. I'm going to go volunteer with elephants. I'm telling everyone this for two weeks in the jungle. And it's Thailand. Yeah. 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 So. Mm. But does that make, that make sense to people? I mean, I, I, it seems messy to me even as I say it. But I can't I feel, tell if it makes sense until I start doing it, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, let's I'm see. willing to give it a shot. I thought we were referring to yeah. Don, uh, Chief Stevens' report that something he had put together. I think I had that report, but it would be helpful yeah. to send it around again. I will do so. I remember the section. Data agencies self identifying high discretionary points and how to address it. And you guys were just starting to say that, like, you know, where we have the discretionary calls, whether it's, see, and to me, my one minute less, 10 seconds. Yeah, I'm sorry, seconds. Rebecca. No, my point is, the I mean, we all talked about it, that really it's just this one point in time in this whole spectrum. But one of the things I wanted to share is not to so quickly leave DOC and sentencing and judiciary, is that there is plenty of discretionary calls within sentencing, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we are not even, <coughs> we focus on the cops and the point of initial contact, charging, but the decision to sentence, we have a minimum and a maximum, and a judge decides the minimum number and the maximum. That minimum decide, determines the earliest eligibility for supervised release on parole. Mm -hmm. Whether that person actually gets out on parole is DOC's call, right? So what happens is that we see parole. sentence, parole board. all right, and, so, right <laughs> and the sentencing lengths are not reflective of who is actually serving time in jail. And whether someone gets a probationary sentence, whether they get supervised release, whether they're actually spending time in jail, whether they get out on supervised release, who's getting violated and pulled back in. Well, I agree. That's well, it's yeah. Yeah. And I think Monica made that point earlier. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I agree with yeah. yeah. no, yeah. 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 we are yeah. agree. Right. My point yeah. is, is that, that there are, those are what they, when we talk about what can come up out of this report, uh, where we have the discretion, where there's overlap right. between the sentencing decision and the 
Judiciary and DOC, who's recommending the sentences in the first place, right? The state's attorneys and DOC. We'll see. <coughs> I just didn't want to push this all on the police. Right. Which oh, I totally have no ideas there. Well, I think we've all said <laughs> that it goes across <laughs> all of us. We all have a piece right. of it. Uh, I just want to point out this yeah. one sentence uh, on the first page of the yeah. report that Dom sent around. It says, Key as four key aspects to addressing racial disparity in the criminal justice system. Number one, acknowledge the cumulative nature yeah. of racial yeah. disparity. Yeah. Yeah. Each stage yeah. builds yeah. on the other yeah. from arrest yeah. through parole rather than a single action. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Overall, it sounds like we're on Curtis, you had something you wanted to, <coughs> to bring up before we... So, yeah. The other hat that I wear, I'm the chair of the Vermont State Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and we have approval uh, for our next project for the next year, 18 months, looking at school to prison pipeline. Okay. In Vermont? So, just in Vermont? Just in Vermont. Right. So uh, I think our first hearing, our community forum, will be January 19th uh, in Brattleboro, uh, location and time to be announced. Right. <coughs> okay. All right. Thank you.